Welcome to the Thousand Nights and One Night. Now, when it was the five hundred and twenty-sixth night, she continued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the lady Shamsah's mother ended with saying, And if it so please thee, we will send thee year after year, a company of which each and every can destroy thy foes to the last man. Then King Shalan sat down on his throne, and summoning his grandees and officers of state, bade them make ready for the marriage festivities, and decorate the city seven days and nights. We hear and obey, answered they, and busied themselves two months in the preparations, after which they celebrated the marriage of the prince and princess, and held a mighty festival. Never was there one like it before. Then they brought Janshah into his bride, and he abode with her in all solace of life and delight for two years, at the end of which time he said to her, Thy father promised to send us to my native land, that we might pass one year there and the next here. Answered she, I hear and obey. And going to King Shalan at nightfall told him what the prince had said. Quoth he, I consent. But have patience with me until the first of the month, that I may make ready for your departure. She repeated these words to her husband, and they waited till the appointed time, when the king bade the Maries bring out to them a great litter of red gold, set with pearls and jewels, and covered with a canopy of green silk, purfled in a profusion of colors, and embroidered with precious stones, dazzling with its goodliness to the eyes of every beholder. He chose out four of his marids to carry the litter in whichever of the four quarters the rider might choose. Moreover, he gave his daughter three hundred beautiful damsels to wait upon her, and bestowed on Janshah the like number of white slaves of the sons of the jinn. Then the lady Shamsah took formal leave of her mother and sisters, and all her kith and kin, and her father fared forth with them. So the four marids took up the litter, and each by one corner, and rising under it like birds in air, flew onward with it between earth and heaven, till midday when the king bade them set it down, and all alighted. Then they took leave of one another, and King Shalon commended Shamsah to the prince's care, and giving them in charge to the Marids, carried and returned to the castle of the jewels, whilst the prince and princess remounted the litter, and the Marids, taking it up, flew on for ten whole days, in each of which they accomplished thirty months' journey, till they sighted the capital of King Tegmus. Now one of them knew the land of Kabul, so when he saw the city he bade the others let down the litter at that populous place which was the capital. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day, and ceased to say her permitted say. Now, when it was the five hundred and twenty-eighth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the Marid guards let down the litter at the capital of King Tegmas, who had been routed and had fled from his foes into the city where he was in sore straits. King Kafid, having laid close siege to him, he sought to save himself by making peace with the king of Hind, but his enemy would give him no quarter. So, seeing himself without resources or means of relief, he determined to strangle himself and to die, and be at the rest from his trouble and mercy. Accordingly, he bade his wazirs and emirs farewell and enter his house to take leave of his harem, and the whole realm was full of weeping and wailing and lamentations and woe, and whilst this rout was hurly-burly was enacting, behold, the marids descended from the litter upon the palace that was in the citadel, and Janshah bade them set him down in the midst of the divan. They did his bidding, and he alighted with his company of handmaids and mamelukes, and, seeing all the folk in the city in straits and desolation and sore distress, said to the princess, O love of my heart, and cooleth of mine eyes, look in what a piteous plight is my sire. Thereupon she made the marine guard fall upon the beleaguering host and slay them, saying, Kill you all, even to the last man. And Janshah commanded one of them, by naming Karatash, who was exceedingly strong and valiant, to bring King Kafid to him in chains. So they set down the litter and covered it with the canopy. Then, having waited till midnight, they attacked the enemy's camp, one of them being a match for ten, or at least of eight. And while these others smote the foes with iron maces, 
those mounted their magical elephants and soared high in the lift, and then swooping down and snatching up their opponents, tear them into pieces in mid-air. But Karatash made straight for Kafid's tent, where he found him lying in a couch. So he took him up, shrieking for fear, and flew with him to Janshah, who bade the four marids bind him on the litter and hang him high in the air over his camp, that he might witness the slaughter of his men. He did as the prince commanded them, and left Kafid, who had swooned for fear, hanging between earth and air, and buffeting his face for grief. As for King Tegmas, when he saw his son, he well nigh died for excess of joy, and crying with a loud cry, he fell down into a swoon. They sprinkled rose water on his face, till he came to himself, when he and his son embraced and wept with sore weeping for he knew not that the jinn guard were battling with King Kafid's men. Then Princess Shamsa accosted the king, and kissing his hand said to him, Sire, be pleased to go up with me to the palace roof, and witness the slaughter of thy foes by my father's marids. So he went up to the terrace roof, and sitting down there with his daughter-in-law, enjoyed watching the marids do havoc among the besiegers, and break away through the length and breadth of them. For one of them smote with his iron mace upon the elephants and their riders and pounded them till man was not to be distinguished from beast, whilst another shouted in the faces of those who fled so that they fell down dead. And the third caught up a score of horsemen, beast and all, and towering with them high in the air, cast them down on earth so that they were torn in pieces." And this was high enjoyment for Janshah and his father and the lady Shamsa. And Shaharazad perceived the dawn of the day and ceased saying her permitted say. Now, when it was the five hundred and twenty-ninth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that King Tegmas and his son and daughter-in-law went up to the terrace roof and enjoyed a prospect of the jinn guards battling with the beleaguering host, and King Kafid, still hanging between heaven and earth, also saw the slaughter of his troops and wept sore and buffeted his face, nor did the carnage cease among the army of Hind for two whole days, till they were cut off even to the last man. Then Janshah commanded a marid by the name of Shimwal, chain up King Kafid with manacles and fetters, and imprison him in a tower called the Black Bulwark. And when his bidding was done, King Tamas bade beat the drums and dispatch messengers to announce the glad news to Janshah's mother, informing her of his approach. Whereupon she mounted in great joy, and she no sooner espied her son than she clasped her in her arms and swooned away for stress of gladness. They sprinkled rose water on her face till she came to herself, when she embraced him again and again and again, and wept for excess of joy. And when the lady, Shamsa, knew of her coming, she came to her and saluted her, and they embraced each other, and after remaining embraced for an hour, sat down to converse. Then King Tegmas threw open the city gates and dispatched couriers to all parts of the kingdom to spread the tidings of his happy deliverance, whereupon all princely vassals and emirs and the grandees of the realm flocked to salute him and give him joy of his victory and of the safe return of his son. And they brought him great store of rich offerings and curious presents. The visits and oblations continued for some time, after which the king made a second and a more splendid bride feast for the princess Shamsa, and bade decorate the city and held high festival. Lastly, they unveiled and paraded the bride before Janshah, with apparel and ornaments of the utmost magnificence. And when her bridegroom went in to her, he presented her with an hundred beautiful slave girls to wait upon her. Some days after this, the princess repaired to the king and interceded with him for Kafid, saying, Suffer him return to his own land, and if henceforward he be minded to do thee a hurt, I will bid one of the jinn guards snatch him up and bring him to thee. Replied Tegmas, I hear and I obey, and bade Shimwal bring him the prisoner, 
who came manacled and fettered and kissed earth between his hands. Then he commanded to strike off his chains, and mounting him on a lame mare, said to him, Verily, Princess Shamsa hath interceded for thee. So be gone to thy kingdom, but if thou fall again to thine old tricks, she will send one of the Marids to seize thee, and bring thee hither. Thereupon King Kafid set off homewards in the sorriest of plights. And Shahrazad received the dawn of the day, and ceased to say her permitted say. Now, when it was the five hundred and thirtieth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that King Kafid set off homewards in the sorriest of plights, whilst Janshah and his wife abode in all solace and delight of life, making the most of its joyance and happiness. All this recounted the youth sitting between the tombs unto Bulukia, ending with, And behold, I am Janshah, who witnessed all these things. O my brother, O Bulukia! Then Bulukia, who was wandering the world in his love for Mohammed, whom Allah bless and keep, asked Janshah, O my brother, what be these two sepulchres, and why sittest thou between them, and what causeth thy weeping? He answered, No, O Bulukia, that we abode all in silence and delight of life, passing one year at home, and the next at Takni, the castle of jewels, whether we betook not ourselves, but in the litter borne by the Marids, and flying between heaven and earth. Quoth Bulukia, O my brother, O Janshah, what was the distance between the castle and thy home? Quoth he, Every day we accomplished a journey of thirty months, and the time we took was ten days. We abode on this wise um, many of years, till one year we set out for the castle of jewels, as was our wont, and on the way thither alighted from the litter in this island to rest and take our pleasure therein. We sat down on the river bank and ate and drank, after which the lady Shamsa, having a mind to bathe, put off her clothes and plunged into the water. Her women did likewise, and they swam about a while, while I walked along the bank of the stream, leaving them to swim about and play one with the other. And behold, a huge shark of the monsters of the deep seized the princess by the leg without touching any of the other girls, and she cried out and died forthright, whilst the damsels fled out of the river to the pavilion to escape from the shark. But after a while they returned, and taking up her corpse, carried her to the litter. Now, when I saw her dead, I fell down fainting, and they sprinkled water on my face till I recovered, and I wept over her. Then I dispatched the gin guards to her parents and family, announcing what had befallen her. And then in the shortest time they came to the spot and washed her and shrouded her, after which they buried her by the riverside and made mourning for her. They would have carried me with them to their own country, but I said to King Shanlan, I beseech thee to dig me a grave beside her tomb, that when I die I may be buried by her side in that grave. Accordingly, the king commanded one of his marids to do as I wished, after which they departed and left me here to weep and mourn for her till I die. And this is my story, and the cause of my sojourn between these two tombs. And he repeated these two couplets. The house, sweet heart, is now no home to me, since thou art gone, nor neighbor neighborly. The friend will all my took to heart no more is friend, and brightest lights lose brilliancy. But when Bulukia heard out Janshah's tale, he marveled. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day, and ceased saying her permitted say. Now, when it was the five hundred and thirty-first night, she said, it hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Bulukia heard out Janshah's tale, he wondered and exclaimed, By Allah, methought I had indeed wandered over the world and compassed it about. But now I forget all I have seen after listening to these adventures of thine. He was silent a while, and then resumed, I beg thee of thy favor and courtesy to direct me in the way of safety. So Janshah directed him into the right road, and Bulukia farewelled him and went on his way. All this the serpent queen related to his sheep Karim al-Din, and he asked her, But how knowest thou of these things? And she answered, O Hashib, 
Thou must keen that I had occasion some five hundred and twenty years ago to send one of my largest serpents to Egypt, and gave her a letter for Bulukia, saluting him. So she went there willingly, for she had a daughter in the land called Bint Shuka. And after asking Anit, Bulukia, she found him and gave him my missive. He read it, in reply to the messenger's snake. Thou comest from the queen of serpents, whom I am minded to visit, for I have an occasion to her. She replied, I hear and obey. Then she bore him to her daughter, of whom she took leave, and said to her companion, Close thine eyes. So he closed them, and opening them again, behold, he found himself on the mountain where I now am. Then his guide carried him to the great serpent, whom he saluted, whereupon quoth she, Didst thou deliver the missive to Bulukia? She replied, Even so, and he hath accompanied me, and here he standeth. Presently Bulukia asked after me. The serpent queen and the great serpent answered, She hath gone to the mountain Kaf with all her hosts, as her sir want in winter. The next summer she will come hither again. As often as she goes thither, she appointed me to reign in her room during her absence, and if thou have any occasion to her, I will accomplish it for thee, said he. I bid thee to bring me the herb, which whoso crusheth and drinketh the juice thereof, sickeneth, not neither groweth gray nor dieth. I, I will not bring it, said the serpent, till thou tell me what befell thee since thou leftest the queen of the serpents to go with Aphrodite to the quest of King Solomon's tomb. So he related to her all his travels and adventures together with the history of Janshaw, and said at last, Grant me my request, that I may return to mine own country, replied the serpent. By the virtue of the Lord Solomon, I know not where is to be found the herb whereof thou speakest. Then she bade the serpent which had brought him thither carry him back to Egypt. So the messenger obeyed and said to him, Shut thine eyes. He did so and opening them again, found himself on the mountain Mukatam. When I returned from the mountain Calf, added the queen, the serpent, my deputy, informed me of Bulukia's visit, and gave me his salutations, and repeated to me his story and his meeting with Janshah. And this, O Hashib, is how I came to know the adventures of Bulukia and the history of Janshah. Thereupon Hashib said to her, O queen, Dane recount to me what befell Bulukia as regards to his return to Egypt. She replied, No, O Hashib, that when he parted with Janshah, he fared on nights and days till he came to a great sea. So he anointed his feet with the juice of the magical herb, and walking over the face of the waters, sped onwards till he came to an island abounding in trees and springs and fruits, as it were the Garden of Eden. He landed and walked about till he saw an immense tree with leaves as big as the sails of a ship. So he went up to the tree and found under it a table, spread with all manner of meats, whilst on a branch of the branches sat a great bird, whose body was of pearls and leek green emeralds, its feet of silver, its beak of red carnelian, and its plumery of precious metals, and it was engaged in singing the praises of all of the Most High and blessings, Mohammed, on whom be benediction and peace. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day and ceased to say her permitted say. Now, when it was the five hundred and thirty second night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Bulukia landed and walked about the island, he found himself there with many marvels especially a bird whose body was of pearls and leek green emeralds and its plumery of precious metals and it was engaged in singing the praises of allah the most high and blessing mohammed upon whom be benediction and peace seeing this he said who and what art thou quoth the bird i am one of the birds of eden and followed adam when allah almighty cast him out thence and know o my brother that Allah also cast out with him four leaves of the trees of the garden to cover his nakedness with all, and they fell to the ground after a while. One of them was eaten by a worm, and of it came silk. The gazelles ate the second, and thence proceeded musk. The third was eaten by bees and gave rise to honey, whilst the fourth 
fill in the land of Hind, and from it sprang all manner of spices. As for me, I wandered over the face of the earth till Allah deigned give me this island for a dwelling place, and I took up my abode here. And every Friday, from night till morning, the saints and princes of the faith flock to this place and make pious visitation and eat from this table spread by Allah Almighty. And after they have eaten, the table is taken away up again to heaven. Nor doth the food ever waste or corrupt. So Bulukia ate his fill of the meats and praised the great creator. And presently, behold, there came up al Kazir, with whom be peace. At sight of which Bulukia rose and saluting him was about to withdraw when the bird said to him, Sit, O Bulukia, in the presence of al Kazir, on whom be peace. So he sat down again. And al Khazir said to him, Let me know who thou art, and tell me thy tale. Whereupon Bulukia related to him all his adventures from beginning to end, and asked, O my lord, how far is it hence to Cairo? Five and ninety years' journey, replied the prophet. Whereupon Bulukia burst into tears, then falling at al Khazir's feet, kissed them, and said to him, I beseech thee. Deliver me from this strangerhood, and thy reward be with Allah, for that I am nigh upon death, and I know not what to do. Quoth al Ghazir, Pray to Allah Almighty, that he permit me to carry thee to Cairo, ere thou perish. So Bulukia wept, and humbled himself before Allah, who granted his prayer, and by inspiration bade al Ghazir bear him to his people. Then said the Prophet, Lift thy head, for Allah hath heard thy prayer, and hath inspired me to do what thou desirest. So take fast hold of me with both thy hands, and shut thine eyes. The prince did as he was bidden, and al Khazir stepped a single step forwards, and then said to him, Open thine eyes. So Bulukia opened his eyes, and found himself at the door of his palace at Cairo. He turned to leave of al Khazir, but found no trace of him. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day and ceased to say her permitted say. Now, when it was the 533rd night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Bulukia, standing at the gate of his palace, turned to take leave of al Khazir, he found no trace of him and entered the palace. When his mother saw him, she cried with a loud cry and swooned away with excess of joy, and they sprinkled water upon her face. After a while, she came to herself and embraced her son and wept with sore weeping, whilst Bulukia wept and laughed by turns. Then all his friends and kindred came and gave him joy to his safe return, and the news was noised abroad in the land, and there came to him presents from all parts. Moreover, they beat the drums and blew the flutes and rejoiced mightily. Then Bulukia related to them his adventures, ending with accounting how al Khazir had set him down at his palace door, where they marveled exceedingly and wept till all were weary of weeping. The Seeb wondered at the queen's tale and shed many tears over it. Then he again besought her to let him return to his family. But she said, I fear me, O Hasib, that when thou gettest back to thy country, thou wilt fail of thy promise and prove traitor to thine oath and enter the Hammon. But he swore to her another solemn oath that he would never again enter the bass as long as he lived. Whereupon she called a serpent and bade him carry her up to the surface of the earth. So the serpent took him and led him from place to place till she brought him out on the platform edge of an abandoned cistern and there left him. Upon this, he walked to the city, and coming to his house, by the last of the day, at the yellowing of the sun, and knocked at the door. His mother opened it, and seeing her son, screamed out, and threw herself upon him, and wept for excess of joy. His wife heard her mother-in-law weeping, so she came out to her, and seeing her husband, saluted him, and kissed his hands. And each rejoiced in the other, while exceeding joy and all three of them. Then they entered the house and sat down to converse. And presently Hasib asked his mother of the woodcutters, who had left him to perish in the cistern. Quoth she, They came and told me that a wolf had eaten thee in the wady. 
As for them, they are become merchants and own houses and shops, and the world has grown wide for them. But every day they bring me meat and drink, and thus have they done until the present time. Quoth the Seeb, Tomorrow do thou go to them and say, My son Hasib Karim al-Din hath returned from his travels, so come ye to meet him and salute him. Accordingly, when morning dawned, she repaired to the woodcutter's house and delivered to them her son's message, which when they heard, they changed color, and saying, uh, We hear and obey, gave her each a suit of silk embroidered with gold, adding, Present this to thy good son, and tell him that we will be with him tomorrow. She ascended and returned to Asib, gave him the presents and messages. Meanwhile, the woodcutters called together a number of merchants, and acquainting them with all that had passed between himself and Asib, took counsel with him with what they should do. Quoth the merchants, it behooveth each of you to give him half his monies and mamelukes, and they all agreed to do so. So on the next day, each of them took half his wealth, and going into his seed, saluted him and kissed his hands. Then they laid before him what they had brought, saying, This is of thy bounties, and we are in thy hands. He accepted their peace offering and said, What past is past? That which befell us was a decree of Allah, and destiny doth away with dexterity. Quoth he, Come, let us walk about, and take our solace in the city, and visit the Hammond. Quoth he, Not so. I have taken an oath never again to enter the bath so long as I live. Rejoin thee, At least come to our homes, that we may entertain thee. He agreed to this, and went to their houses, and each of them entertained him for a night and a day. Nor did they cease to do thus, for a whole sen night being seven in number, and now Hasib was master of monies, and houses, and shops, and the merchants of the city foregathered with him, and he told them all that had befallen him. He became one of the chiefs of the guild, and abode on this wise a while, till it happened one day, he was walking about the street, that he passed the door of a hammond whose keeper was one of his companions. When the bathman who was standing without caught his eye, he ran up to him and saluted him and embraced him, saying, Favor me by entering the bath, and there wash and be rubbed, that I may show thee hospitality. Hasib refused, alleging that he had taken a solemn oath never again to enter the hammond. But the bathman was instant with him, saying, Be my three wives, triply divorced, as thou enter not, and be washed. When Hasib heard him thus conjure him, he was confounded and replied, O my brother, Hast thou a mind to ruin my house, and make my children orphans, and lay a load of sin upon my neck? But his friend threw himself at his feet, and kissed him, saying, My happiness dependeth upon thy entering, and be the sin on the neck of me. Then all the servants of the bath set upon his sheep, and dragging him in, pulled off his clothes. But hardly had he sat down against the wall, and began to pour water on his head, when a score of men accosted him, saying, Rise, O man, and come with us to the sultan for thou art his, de de his debtor. Then they dispatched one of them as messenger to the sultan's minister, who straightway took course and rode, attended by threescore mamelukes, to the baths, where he alighted and going into Seb, saluted him and said, Welcome to thee. Then he gave the bathman an hundred dinars, and mounting his Seb on a horse he had brought with him, returned with him and all his men to the sultan's palace. Here he bade them aid Hasib to dismount, and after seating him comfortably, set food before him. And when they had eaten and drunken and washed their hands, the wazir clad him in two dresses of honor, each worth five thousand dinars, and said to him, Know that Allah hath been merciful to us in sending thee. But the sultan is nigh upon death by leprosy, and the books tell us that his life is in thy hands. Then accompanied by a host of grandees, he took him wandering withal, and carried him through the seven doorways of the palace, till they came to the king's chamber. Now the name of this king was Karazdan, king of Persia, and of the seven countries, and under his sway were an hundred sovereign princes, sitting on chairs of red gold, and ten thousand valiant captains, under each one's hand, and an hundred deputies, and as many herdsmen armed with sword and axe. They found the king lying on his bed, and his face swathed in a napkin, and groaning for excess of pain. When Hasib saw this ordinance, his wit was dazed for awe of the king, so he kissed the ground before him, and prayed a blessing on him. Then the grand wazir, whose name was Shamhur, 
rose and walking him Hashib, seated him on a high chair at the king's right hand. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day, and ceased to say her permitted say. And so do I cease the telling of my tale until the morrow.